we have a lot of brush, as you can see from these photos. Um, this particular pasture, when I was doing my management plan, we had to zero it out to zero AUs, which is an animal unit. Um, it was pretty substantial. You couldn't even walk through it, the prickly pear is so bad. So we just kind of decided that we were going to work with Mother Nature, and if it wanted to burn in the summertime, then that's probably the way to do it. So we came through, and we um, have been aiming for summertime burns to start with. Um, our goal is a reclamation burn, hotter the better. Uh, so the picture with the barn, um, this one, this was a mid-July burn last year. Uh, it burned really hot, really scary. None of my coworkers wanted to show up to this one, so we knew it was going to be good. And uh, it went even better than expected. And we did come through and spray afterward, but it, there was nothing to spray, really. It was just my bosses wanted to spray something. So, um, But you can see the fuel load in the next picture, and that's less than a year later. Um, so we've had really amazing results from the summertime burning. Um, and then once we get going, we're going to start adjusting that and we'll start doing some you know, spring and fall time burns as well. But uh, So this picture shows the left um, is not burned, but that's prepped for our next burn. And then this is our July burn on the right again. Oh. Yeah, so this is just a good way to see just one side of the road or the other. We used our road as the fire guard and just kind of went off to the side of it a little bit. Um, but you can just stand right there and see on the left, this was what the pasture on the right looked like one year ago. And this is just one burn um, that we were able to go through there and clean everything up and grew so much more grass um, compared to just the other side of the road. Same pasture, same everything. But that's just what it, the fire can do to get things cleaned up. We try to use a lot of roads. A lot of, uh, like this is our main road that goes straight, straight to our house. But we try to use pasture roads and improve that if we can for the fire guard. Um, we've been able to, we've had to replace a lot of fencing. So a lot of times we'll kind of plan our burns around when we're doing a fencing project. And then we've got the expense of doing the fencing already and then we can amateurize that expense for the fire guard as well. Um, so that's kind of been an easier way to do it for us, but that's um, not always possible. But I mean it's been really economical either way. I think our most expensive burn was about $18 an acre all in. So um, and that was pretty drastic from what the other ones were. So this is after the fire, you can see all the pear that was in there. Um, you really don't even realize it. Like, we knew we had a lot of pear, but then once we burned and got all that grass out, you can see, like, we had so much more pear than we knew what to do with. And then just after that, that's what it looks like just after one reclamation burn in the summertime. We do get a little bit of re-sprouting um, from like bee brush and stuff like that, but you know our cat claw for the most part has actually not started to re-sprout yet anyway. Um, and then most of the prickly pear is toast, unless it's a really big stand that has a lot of green in the middle after the burn still, that'll kind of re-sprout a little bit. But like Tasajillo, that hasn't re-sprouted all. Yeah. Historically in our area, I think that it used to burn every three to five years, so we're kind of using that as a guideline. Um, and that, I have to work with our cattle manager on that too because I do need it to be deferred for a certain amount of time before I can burn and all that kind of stuff, so it, there's going to have to be some room for adjustment. But for instance, this particular pasture, if we don't graze it down, I'm going to burn it probably next year because I don't want that kind of fuel load hanging around my house because my house is pretty close. Um, so if we're not grazing it down, it needs to burn. And, uh, and once we get going, we're burning, we're aiming to burn about 5,000 acres a year uh, this year. Once we get going, we're wanting to up that to about 
you know, 10, 12,000 acres, something like that. But we're having trouble getting our fire guards in at the moment, so that's kind of the limiting factor. We're in some pretty <laughs> rough stuff once you get down around the edges, and it's all just rock and huge overgrowth of cedars. It's, you know, it's been 50 years since anybody's even seen that fence. And so we uh, are punching through right now, and once we do the hard work right now, clearing everything out, getting everything stable and usable, we'll be able to just do, you know, maintenance burns in the spring or the fall or the winter. Or summer. If or the summer, yeah. If, but it's not that, it's not that uh, overwhelming of a deal. Um, it's how you do it the first time is not going to be how you do it every time. It's going to get easier every time you do it. And so we're putting in the hard work now, cleaning everything up, making everything functional and really safe so that we every burn we do is really successful and it, it really is paying off uh, in the long run another thing that we're kind of playing with right now is we have some pastures that have been overgrazed for so long that we don't have a lot of fine fuel in there and so we've come through and kind of done some more mediocre burns and then coming back the next year and burning that again because we saw such a response just a year later um, for instance, Treadwell mentioned the one that we did, and it was actually in March, and it was a really green burn, and everybody was really disappointed, and all my coworkers were like, oh, we told you, blah, blah, blah. And then we came back, and we burned it a couple weeks ago, and it just scorched everything. But then all the live oaks are fine. So I think that was the perfect way to go with that one. Yeah, I think one of the big keys, just being an operator, you know, we're not professional burners. We're we just manage the property, but be flexible. You, know, you can't force the fire to do what you want it to do, and you can't say, I'm gonna burn on July 12th, and that's when we're gonna do it. It's, you just take what nature can give you, and what Treadwell refers to as the layup is, uh, it was a, uh, from what, the outside perspective, they said, oh, you know, that's a, it wasn't that good of a burn, but we came back and everything that we burned came back in such healthier and more full grass. And uh, like through all these prickly pads, right in here and everything, if there, there wasn't any grass growing up through them. There was no fuel in any of that, and so the fire just kind of skipped around it. So they just kind of threw it off that, oh, you know, you didn't get that pear or nothing, just wasting time. But after the fire, we got much more fine fuel came through and we started to get stuff sprouting up through the pear and all that, so then we came back this summer and burning it was one of the best burns I've ever seen that pair is already laid down it's already <coughs> you can see if you pull up the west trap so this here go back this is what the west trap looked like before we did any burn and you can see there's a lot of rocks in there not really a lot of stuff was growing in there other than undesirables that nobody really cared about and once we burned it, it looked like the moon at first, and uh, everybody was really scared about it. And then when it came back, everywhere that didn't have vegetation before we burned came back with just gorgeous grass afterward. And they couldn't believe that I got that just from one growing season. Yeah, everybody's, everybody's different. Every fire's different. You can't, like, reading out of a textbook, you know, that's not really going to get you very far as as far as understanding what to expect and uh, so seeing it like tomorrow seeing the actual burn will be a lot easier i saw a lot of hands that are really, uh, people wanting to burn but don't have any experience with it and i was like that my only experience was fighting wildfires up in matador ranching up there for the 2011 fires and that whole culture up there is you know you put it out as soon as you see a flame and it's a big on all of that and uh, now that we started doing these prescribed burns and everything goes great it's you get more comfortable with it and it's not that scary it sounds like it and you know it sounds very science and technical but there's all these charts and red tape and stuff like that but that's all just covering the basis of actually doing it it's not that daunting of a task and it'll get easier every time you do it and now you know whenever Treadwell would come out to help us burn and he'd be driving around with us and pointing out all these 
trouble spots and things to for me to clear out and watch out for and kind of clean this up a bit take that cedar down and stuff like that and once you start burning you're able to do that on your own you can look out on your own property and see that this is going to be a problem this is going to be an issue and you can go in and push a pile farther in or bust it up into smaller piles or trim up some cedar that might be able to ladder the fire up into the canopy and stuff like that so it's really it gets a lot easier just getting a little bit of experience with it and I'm a big proponent of it coming from a culture of you know fire was the worst thing you could ever you could ever have. And we've done a lot of fires out there at this point and not a single one of them has gone how we thought it would um, <laughs> but in a good way um, we haven't had any get out of control yet so that's been good but you know we've always had kind of preconceived notions on how it was going to burn and how the terrain was going to react and not one of them has gone that way um, so i've just kind of learned to not set any expectations and then i come back afterward and assess what burned what didn't and then that kind of affects my management plan going forward and when that next burn is. So uh, we did, let's see, we did two burns in, or did we do one in May, one in June? Um, they're on the north part of the ranch, which is a little bit greener, and it didn't burn quite how I wanted it to, but we didn't have the fine fuel load up there either because of the, the grazing situation. Um, so we're probably not going to spray. We're probably going to come back and burn it next year is the current plan. So um, I'm just kind of trying to stay flexible with it and then also just trying to get the fire guards set early enough in the year that once summer hits, I can just roll with it. And if I have a bunch of good burn days in a row, then I can light them all. I'm not having to wait on my guys to get everything squared away because you're never going to have a perfect situation, but um, yeah, I guess we'll just go through just step by step what we do, I guess, for our program. So at the beginning of the year, we assess maybe, let's say we're aiming for 5,000 acres to burn this year. So we go through the pastures, look at our fuel loads, look at the needs and the brush and all of that. And then same thing, we in incorporate the fencing projects, any pasture roads that need updating, anything that that needs work, we'll try to incorporate that and use a pasture road as our fire line so that we're improving our road while simultaneously putting in a, a fire guard and same thing with the fencing. And so we'll go through and we'll, we'll pick our pastures, we'll plan it all out, and then we'll try to do our fire guards all as soon as we can early on. And then uh, if there is any sort of regrowth or anything like that, we'll come through the sprayer and just round up it and keep everything clean and clear, but we've only had to do that maybe twice, if anything. But yeah, so we, we stay, that gives us the ability to stay flexible so that when the conditions are right, we can go ahead and just pull the trigger and say, light it up, and we're already ready to go, and there's not that much, not that much to it. We don't have to wait around, and the longer you wait, that's when it gets dangerous. We just had a, a wildfire, month ago maybe from a lightning strike and then uh, so lightning struck our neighbor and it was a big old storm and uh, two days later is when all of a sudden smoke picked up and it struck a tree and uh, smoldered for a while and then once everything dried out enough that's when the fire blew up and uh, came over onto us from the neighbor but we had just burned the pasture to the south of there which to the south uh, it's not like the head fire was heading that way, but we were still able to use that pasture that we had just burned. You know, that's totally safe. We don't have to worry about it. Don't fool with it. We could totally focus on just keeping it contained and everything was fine. So it was a, it's a, for us, with how rough we are and how far out we are, it's a big boost to be able to do these burns in the right locations that keep wildfires better under control and easier to work on as well. And, uh, and so. that wildfire only burned 70 acres yes. because that pasture had been prescribed burned three years prior. So um, yeah, super, super useful because we're in really rough country. So if we have a wildfire, 
it's really difficult for our, our neighbor had to get one there. two years ago and the fire department uh, broke an axle and did four thousand dollars of damage on two fire trucks just trying to get out to fight the fire on the neighbor same country as us and so not even just for improving the land for grazing and adding grass it's a good thing to do for just protecting your your home your barns your whatever you want to keep not burn which is like what we did here in the middle of this path we burnt the whole this this was two pastures we burned them at the same time and just burnt through the cross fence because we were going to redo it and then uh, we had this old shed in there and uh, what we did is i went through early the night evening before with a weed whacker and every bit of grass that you see i just went through and weed whacked and then the day of the fire uh, after treadwell had set the black and the fire was already going we just popped over in there and uh, lit a fire around it and then set a good bit of black around it put that little bit out and then walked away let the whole fire carry through and nothing nothing touched it and so there's a lot of easy quick and easy stuff you can do just weed whacking around your buildings or anything feeders deer, deer blinds we just weed whack around them and keeps it real simple it's not it's not an emergency it didn't make a big deal and as long as there's not propane yeah as long as there's no <laughs> propane in there we had some hunters tell us the day <laughs> of the burn we had already lit the fire and finally the hunters let us know that they had propane in their hunting blinds and so we had to, uh, we that's not fun we ran through and that's the, where communication yeah communication <laughs> <laughs> but they had also padlocked their deer blinds too so we had to run in there cut the lock pull the propane out they said maybe a couple bottles we pulled like 12 16 16 16 propane bottles yeah, from one so, brand. so it gets exciting but same thing we, we ran in there and did these little burns around them and they were all low to the ground plywood the worst possible thing you could have and we didn't lose a single we haven't left we haven't lost a single building or anything and we also aim for like thousand acre burns that's kind of our our goal size um we could do bigger but we just don't really get the the coverage on bigger and then smaller it's just not as cost effective for us so about a thousand burns is our or a thousand acres is our sweet spot and we start probably about eight in the morning at the latest and they're oh maybe about two two thirty we're already pretty well done and everybody you know you do a lap and then after that it's just up to us to do the do the rounds um, some things to help would be like to keep if you have access to a bobcat or a skid steer or anything like that keep it around some of these old trees and stuff <coughs> that are close to the edges um, we call it chimney out and once those things start burning it'll make a vortex and shoot embers up farther into the air and then kind of let them drift away and so after the fire and more at night when you can actually see what's red and glowing and what's actually a problem will come through and push trees over just get them on the ground just anything to keep them from shooting sparks up in the air and we haven't had a single issue of well like, we used to let it smolder but I like my sleep too much so now we just put it out with the yeah, fire X so well, thank you guys uh, any questions It's the uh, metal tracks that go over the tires. We also have rubber tires too, but our stuff is so rocky that it, it'll buck you off. 